We're in a sermon series titled Refocus. God laid it upon my heart that we are in a season that we need to get really serious about one thing, and that's Jesus. Our lives have to emulate this, this Messiah, this King of Kings that was prophesied for thousands of years and actually did all that he came to do. We do know that Jesus is coming back, and we want our lives to be refocused on purpose, intentionally on him and how he wants us to live. We'll be in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 4. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and pull them on out. I'll be reading it out of the ESV. Our brother Peter puts it this way. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in me will not be put to shame. Peter goes on, he says, So the honor is for you who believe, but for you that don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they disobeyed the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you asking for your presence. We ask, God, that, that you would have this text to make sense in our hearts and in our lives. We live in a world that, that has its own agenda, its own message. And so, God, we sit under yours this morning, and we ask that you would open our spiritual eyes to literally see what you want us to see. You'd open our spiritual ears to hear, God, what it is that you're speaking and what you want to reveal. You're alive. You're just as real as me standing here, and I thank you for that. I thank you for conquering sin and death, Jesus, so we can learn from you. We bow our hearts before you, Jesus, and we ask that you would help this time to be uh, just an amazing time to glorify you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's dive in. Verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. As you come to him. Just stop for a moment. As you come to him, this means you actually, as Christ's followers, who he's speaking to directly, you're coming to the King of Kings. We don't just come to him once. We don't just say a prayer and we say we're sorry for sinning and never come to him. But this is a continual action of we're coming to him. This is, this is the life of a Christ follower, the love of Christ coming into us as we pour it out into others as we continue to come to him. He says, he, as you come to him, this, this living stone, this is the title of Jesus Christ, this living stone. And I don't know about you, if you've been in church for any more than a week, you understand that that's a church word. I've never seen a living stone. It's kind of an oxymoron if you think about it. Every stone that I've ever met is just kind of a rock, right? But here we have this rock that's alive. And you're like, that's a really unique title that you would give to somebody. So he's the, this is the idea of Jesus Christ because he conquered sin and death. He's now alive right? He has been prophesied as being the stone. So now he is a living stone because Jesus Christ is alive. That's what Peter calls him. And, and Peter's actually quoting Psalm 118, verse 22. Peter quotes a lot of the Old Testament. And he's quoting Psalm 118, 22 that says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is exactly, Peter's going to reference this a couple of times in this text alone this morning. Jesus is this prophesied stone. Prophesy being that God spoke through one of his people about a future event, about something that had to occur. Well, that was Jesus Christ, this corner stone, this living stone, if you will. He is the prophesied one. And actually, Peter uses this again when he's arguing with the Pharisees in Acts chapter 4, right? He's, he's talking to these guys, and he says, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. He says, you're responsible for rejecting Jesus Christ. You're responsible for murdering him, and he has now become the cornerstone. And we'll get to Cornerstone here in depth here in a little bit. So just hang tight if you don't understand what that means. What this means, though, is living stone is Jesus is the giver of all life. 
That's what he is. Kids, Jesus is a living stone because he was raised from the dead in victory. It's a true fact. I'm not just saying that to make people feel good. This really occurred 2,000 years ago. Over 500 people witnessed the resurrection of Christ. That's a lot of eyewitnesses that can corroborate this detail of him being the living stone. He's a living stone rejected by men. Rejected in ways that we haven't experienced yet. Why did they reject Jesus Christ? Have you ever thought about this? Why? They rejected him because he didn't meet their expectations. They rejected Jesus because they had something else in their mind. They expected an earthly king to come and do what earthly kings do. Well, Jesus is like, my kingdom is not of this world. But see, they were, their expectations were not met. And, and I know before we can go throw stones at the, uh, at the first church, the, the Jews in particular, about how could they not see it? How could they not? It's so obvious. Well, we're 2,000 years removed. We get to read the whole story, right? But even in our own lives, when people don't meet our expectations, we're pretty quick to put it in our mouth. When they don't meet our expectations about how they're supposed to be living, how they're supposed to speak, how they're supposed to do this, how they're supposed to death, how they're, whatever, when they don't meet our expectations, we're really quick to reject people. So they rejected Jesus because he didn't meet their expectations. They rejected Jesus as they were prophesied to do as well. This was all part of God's sovereign plan. But see, he was rejected. They hated him so much they had him murdered. That takes rejection to a whole nother level. Right? I, I mean, we've rejected people, but I don't, is there anybody in here that's ever murdered somebody because they hated him? That's how much they hated Jesus. That's how much they, they, they were anti-Christ. You see, but they rejected him, but in the sight of God, it says that he has chosen, that Jesus Christ is precious. In God's sight, don't lose, don't, don't, don't lose focus here. This is the point. In the eyes of God, people have rejected Jesus for thousands of years, but in his sight, he's chosen, he's precious. Peter talks about being chosen a lot to the entire the entire epistle. It means that God supernaturally, before time even existed, sovereignly orchestrated the events as he would like them to be played out. This idea that God chose Jesus, he literally had his son be the very vessel that he was that was chosen so that we could be redeemed, that we can be restored, that we can have an opportunity to be forgiven. Jesus was that chosen vessel, and God views him as precious. And if God views our Savior as precious, I think that we've got we to we take a page out of God's book. To be precious means to be priceless. That's how God viewed it, His own Son. That's how God views Jesus Christ. Honest question. How do you view Jesus? Be honest with yourself. Who is Jesus Christ to you today? Answer it in your heart. To God, he was precious. He was chosen. Who is he to you? We, we pattern our life after Jesus Christ. We pattern our life after everything that he did, how he talked, how he engaged. And guess what? He was rejected by men. And guess what? So will you be. For those of you that stand firm for Christ, rejection is coming your way. We live in a world that is considerably increasing with antichrist philosophies, antichrist teachings, antichrist lifestyles. So when you stand over here and you say, no, this is how Jesus lived, this is how he wanted us to live, that's how we're going to live, you will face rejection, you will face persecution. Christ followers, are you ready to face this? Who is Jesus Christ to you? Is he worth being rejected over? We too will be honored by God just like Jesus because we emulate him. We copy Jesus. Peter goes on. He says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So again, we're to emulate Jesus, right? We're to be like Jesus. So we ourselves now are called living stones. Crazy, right? Like that's who we are. We are now living stones worshiping God. Not living stones like Jesus Christ as he took on all of man's depravity and hung him on the cross with himself and died for our sins, giving us an opportunity by being resurrected to have a holy, right relationship with God. We don't get to do that as living stones. He's the living stone. But we get to be living stones. Living examples of Christ, 
on display, how we, how we talk, how we walk, how we, how we live our lives. And so this idea, too, of being a living stone, it's being built up. It's this idea of a house being built or a building being built up. We are a living stone, which means that you're never just used once, right? A living stone is continually used over and over and over again. This idea that, that these stones, all of us that claim to love Jesus Christ, we are living stones being built up in Him. We're literally being set where He wants us and used how He wants us in His spiritual house. It's actually kind of a mind-boggling idea that He would even choose to use us to be a part of His home, about what He wants to get done. And, and this idea of, of, of being built up, we got to know who the master builder is. Who's the master builder? It's Jesus. And he chooses to pick the stones that he wants to use for the very house that he is building. One thing we know about Jesus is that he actually was a carpenter. It's not the best translation because he wasn't a wood carpenter like we have now. He actually dealt in stone. A lot of, a lot of concrete style stones, if you will. And the idea is that he was building his living stones. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus is still doing. Is that you? Are you a living stone being placed and used how he wants you to be placed and used? God has aligned our lives to be set apart as living stones. And it's good. It's very, very good. This idea of a spiritual house, I mean, we talked about it when I walked in. God is all about unity, right? But how is that possible? Because Peter's writing to the elect exiles. They were over hundreds, if not thousands of miles in what's called modern-day Turkey, living in five different provinces. So how could they be a spiritual house? There's not one spiritual house. How is that possible, you might ask yourself. Well, look at it from a spiritual level. We're part of the capital C church around the world. We're a part of one body of Christ. Sure, there may be 128 churches in Whatcom County, but for those that bow a knee to Jesus Christ, we're all part of the same church. This is God's spiritual house that he's using, that he has set apart his own kids to help build and to be a part of. That's us. We're a part of something so much greater than what one little stone could do. That's what God is doing in and through his kids. And what is also awesome about this idea of unity is that we're a part of God's family. So you may feel from time to time like you're all alone. Well, besides the fact that you got the Trinity hanging out with you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you also have a group of believers around the world that love you. You don't even know them yet. So we're a part of something so much greater. He says that we're to be a, a holy priesthood. I love the idea of holy. We talk about it a lot in this church. It means to be set apart. It means to be different from everybody else. It means that God has literally set us apart. We have to live our lives as a holy priesthood. So back in the old days, back in the time of Jesus, long before Jesus, excuse me, back in the times of the Old Testament, we're pretty clear about what a priest did, right? We're pretty clear. They had a, they had a pretty set-aside job. They, were either, they had to be a Levite, so from one specific tribe. And their job, literally, was to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. They were the only ones that were allowed to go into the parts of the temple and offer these sacrifices. It was a very set-apart, very specific, very high-honoring job to be a priest. That's a pretty big deal. It's an honor, right? Well, now we are called what's called a holy priesthood. So we are now the new priests of Jesus Christ. Not in a Catholic sense. That's not what this means. As Christ followers, we are part of a holy priesthood, a set of people that is set apart to be his priest for today. We don't offer any more physical sacrifices. We don't have to, to shed blood and, and slash it on the altar and go through all the rituals that they did. We now do spiritual sacrifices, which we'll unpack here in a minute. But as a holy priesthood, we are now God's priests in his home. We're God's priests wherever we go. This is why we talk often about how we have to represent Christ everywhere we go, because it's hard to be a holy-looking priest when you're acting like the devil. It's just not consistent. So we, 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 are, we are now the priesthood of believers. It's a pretty awesome idea, and that's also part of being a building, uh, living stones for Christ. Oftentimes when I'm counseling people, I will tell them, I am not your priest. You don't get to sit there and confess your sins to me, and somehow I'm going to now go intercede between God and man. That is not my job. My job is to point you to Jesus, See, because Jesus Christ is our high priest. Amen. So we now have our own high priest that we can go to all day long. 
That's who we go to directly. Because God used Jesus Christ to, gap this, to bridge this gap. So that's what he has done as now our high priest. You know what this means, kids? It means that our lives should be lived as though we are priests in a temple. That means high respect. You would never disrespect the temple of God. We are now priests in God's temple. How we live our lives deserves high respect and high honor. Every, that means every ministry that we perform is done with respect and love and honor and admiration for our king. This idea, too, of being a, a holy priesthood, it actually means that we're in this together. There's no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. We link arms as priests for Jesus. And it, it's how God has called. We have way too much me in our society, not near enough us. So we can still be individuals as an us, but we do this. We do this together. We're doing it to offer what's called spiritual sacrifices. You may have no idea what that means. In the Old Testament, like we talked about, it was a physical sacrifice. Usually an animal slit the throat, drained the blood, and splashed on the altar. Forgiveness of sins. Blood covers it, right? But now we get to offer what's called spiritual sacrifices. One word, obedience. To offer spiritual sacrifices means that you obey. This is your spiritual sacrifice to Jesus Christ. It's you putting aside everything else the world is selling. It's you literally not doing what the pagan world around you is doing because you're set apart and holy. But now you're going to walk in obedience. That is our spiritual sacrifice to Jesus Christ. Obedience at all costs is what we're being called to today. This means we don't get to get drunk. We don't get to get high. We don't get to do what the world says we get to do because that does not look like Jesus at all. We live set apart lives, offering our spiritual sacrifice, offering our obedience as gratitude for what he's done. If you love Jesus, your life's going to look like you love Jesus. You going to do it perfect? <laughs> no, no, no. Progress, not perfection. We get it. But you should be actually doing better today than you did yesterday because you love Jesus more. Amen. Getting rid of the stuff that holds us back, right? Offering spiritual sacrifices means that a living stone lives set apart, offering up our obedience. That's all we got to offer. So that's what we do. And we offer these spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. He wants our obedience. He accepts our obedience as a literal sacrifice. And all of this is done through Jesus Christ. Don't miss those last three words. Through Jesus Christ, you can do nothing on your own. Amen. You can absolutely do nothing. And, and we, we get to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Paul talks about it in Romans 12. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. We offer ourselves, how we live our lives is our spiritual worship. And, and you might be saying, well, how do I offer myself as a spiritual worshiper? How do I offer this spiritual sacrifice? He says in verse 2 of chapter 12 of Romans, exactly what we're supposed to do. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Rather, be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You want to offer a spiritual sacrifice? Walk in obedience. You want to offer a spiritual sacrifice? Stop living like the world. You want to offer a spiritual sacrifice? Put all of it away. That's what we're being called to today. And all of this is acceptable to God. This is what pleases Him. If you want to live your life pleasing to God, this is where we start. This is like Christianity 101. Right? Getting rid of everything else that so easily holds us up. It's called sin. Getting rid of all of that and just chasing after Jesus. That's what we're being called to. That is what is acceptable. And guess what? Without Jesus, none of it matters. Isaiah 64 says even our, our, our best day, even the most best deeds that we could possibly do, the nicest thing we could possibly do are nothing but filthy, polluted garments without Jesus. Your best day, your best efforts, worthless without Jesus. With Jesus, now we're presented as righteous. With Jesus, now we're presented as holy. With Jesus, now we can actually do this thing. That's what we're being called to. That is our spiritual sacrifice as a priesthood of holy believers. It's all about Jesus. He goes on and says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. 
Again, Peter goes back to the Bible. I think one of the greatest ways to explain the Bible is to use the Bible to explain the Bible. And that's what Peter does, right? He's basing this doctrinal teaching uh, on the Old Testament again from Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God Yahweh, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. Again, he didn't do it verbatim, and that's okay. We get the point, though, of what Peter is trying to teach us. He's emphasizing the idea that this precious nature of Jesus that God has chosen, that God believes is precious, this nature of Jesus is the cornerstone of our spiritual temple. Stay with me. I know these are a lot of big concepts, but this cornerstone idea of this spiritual temple is only Jesus. So let me, give you an, let me explain to you what a cornerstone is. So back in the day, they used to build way differently than we do. A lot of it had stones. These stones were cut out by what are called builders. The builders wanted a specific size stone that they would use, and they would stack them in a formation, which we would call now a foundation. Make sense? You've seen a foundation. Now picture it with big stones. Well, on the corner of the, uh, where the two sides meet was a very large, what they call a cornerstone. It literally held together both sides of the, of the walls. Everything locks in on this cornerstone. We don't build like that anymore in the sense of how we do our foundations and stuff. But what, one way that I can explain it that might help is what's called a fence. Everybody's seen a fence, right? We can use this one. So what you see right here is the corner fence. It's called an H brace if you're a builder. And this H brace, this corner brace, holds together the entire fence. If that brace is not built right, I don't care how good you lay everything else out, they will not be able to stay up. This entire fence relies on the corner brace for strength and stability. The storms of life come, and that fence is going to knock over without the corner brace. So Jesus is our corner brace. He is our corner stone. He holds everything together. This is what he does. So let's continue on with this idea of a fence. I need to give you a little bit of an analogy. We have a huge fence at our place. We have goats and chickens, and we used to have ducks, but they were sitting ducks, and they're no longer with us. Um, I know, that's a bummer, because we loved our, our little ducks. But, so we have a huge area that's fenced in. We've got a nice little barn that we built for them. And, and, and when they stay inside our fence, our goats and chickens, they're just fine. They're fine. They're covered by trees really hard for the predators to come in and get them because we have them safe in our fence with good corner braces, I will add. What happens if they go out of the fence? They're no longer safe. They're exposed. We have feathers often for those that try to get out of the fence and they get eaten because we've got coyotes, we've got owls, we've got all kinds of fun animals out there. And so they leave their fenced yard that they're supposed to be staying in. Do you see where I'm going with this analogy about how we're supposed to be living our lives inside of the corner fence? We stay where Jesus Christ wants us and we're safe. We stay where Jesus Christ wants us in the cornerstone, in what he's held up together for us. And we're walking in holiness. Now you may be like, well, that's boring. I want what the world offers. Okay, then be honest with yourself that that's what you want. But for me, I know what life is like when I leave the fence. I know what I'm capable of when I chase the things of this world. I know the, the path of destruction that I leave behind me when I leave what God has called me to inside of his fence. God is calling his kids today to live lives that are set apart, which means that we stay in our fence. To be set apart, we get to do what God says we get to do. That's where he can protect us. That means we're not chasing sin. That means that we're not chasing the things of this world. It means that we're going against the very culture. It's called being countercultural. This is what Christians, we do. This is the idea of Jesus being our cornerstone, keeping us all together. We live in the parameters that Christ has set for us, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Quoting Isaiah yet again, he reminds all believers, us right now, that ultimately we won't experience shame. There will be earthly times where we're, we're, we're going to experience some shame and, 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 and being persecuted, but that's not what this is talking about. This is saying that without Jesus, you'll have eternal shame. This is the idea that without Jesus, we will be put to shame. But with Jesus, whoever believes in Jesus Christ, whoever has surrendered their life to him, will not eternally be put to shame. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
There are no other roads that lead to heaven. That's it. You don't follow that road, you'll be put to shame eternally. You rely on the cornerstone to protect you. You rely on the cornerstone for everything that you need, and we will be entered into heaven with him. That just means we rely on him for everything. That's what we do. That's what we do, and that's what Peter's calling us to do. And he says in 7, so the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Okay, lots going on here, but again, for believers, you're good to go. For those that have bowed a knee to Jesus Christ and surrendered their lives, they won't be put to shame. It's a beautiful thing. You're actually honored by God when we do this. It's a pretty cool idea that God has done. But for those that reject Jesus, those that do not bow a knee, those that do not believe, that is a choice that we make, right? Again, Peter's citing uh, Psalm 118, 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's quoting it yet again, saying that this whole building trade idea, right? The builders, they look at the stones, and if the stones don't fit, they get kicked out. That's what he's talking about here. Stones had to pass inspection by the builders. That's a Christian life being lived out. We're going to pass inspection because he's the one chiseling and cutting us how he sees fit. And whether it's referring directly to the Jewish leaders from Acts 4, whether it's referring directly to those that continue to reject Jesus Christ, for those that reject him will be put to shame. And they will be rejected themselves. And so Jesus, as a stone, though, he has another role. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. Those who reject Jesus stumble because they don't want to accept the truth about what he's calling us to. Peter's quoting Isaiah 8.14 right here. 8.14 of Isaiah says, And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So Jesus is now what's called a stone of offense. And, and you know what this means? It means Jesus is not a soft cell. There's no such thing as squishy Jesus. I'm watching mainstream Christianity give us kind of a partial gospel. A lot of churches won't do communion because the blood's offensive. Are you kidding me? Without the blood, I got nothing. Amen. This, this squishy Jesus stuff is, is, is a stone of offense for people because people don't want to submit to the full truths of Christ. You know what Jesus is very particular about? How he's worshipped. I've read the Bible a few times. He says, I need you to live set apart. You can't be making excuses anymore. Don't abuse grace. Jesus says, I need you to, to live a life that is set apart. Some people don't like that. They don't want to believe the word of God. They don't want to submit to the scriptures. They, they, they stumble because they walk away because of some teachings in the Bible. I'll be honest. Yeah, they're countercultural, right? Jesus' views on homosexuality are far different than the cultures that we live in. Jesus' views on what movies we can watch, what music we can listen to, what's best for us is far different than the culture that's around us. People don't like the idea that a, that a woman is supposed to submit to a godly husband. They think that's ridiculous. Well, that's what Christ set up, and it's for our good and for his glory that we do it this way. But the world around us would say, no, I want you to hate people instead of forgiving. No, Jesus says you need to forgive or you're not going to be forgiven. But the world around us doesn't like these truths. The world around us doesn't want to be told what to do. Well, guess what? Jesus tells us what to do a lot. A lot. There's no shortage, right? But it's for our good. He's like, stay in the fence. It's what's best for you. The world is going to choke you. It's going to take your very soul and your very life. And he's like, I know what's best for you. And actually, it's a lot more fun inside the fence. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation. That's what Jesus wants for his kids. He wants us to be moral, Christ-like followers. And in, in the world around us, the culture around us, they teach anti-Christian beliefs. We know this. We've talked about this. It's pretty obvious. But, but for us, then we've got to really honestly stand even farther over here, set apart. That doesn't mean we don't engage. We have to engage the society around us. That will they know the truth unless you tell them, right? So it doesn't mean that we have nothing to do with them. We just don't participate. We just don't do what the world around us is doing. The Jews stumbled back then, about who Christ was, about what Christ had done, about the prophecies about him, and people are still stumbling today because they don't accept the truth. In the second part of 80, he said they stumble 
because they disobey the word. This idea that Jesus Christ is a stone, they, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. They were disobedient to God's word. They didn't want to submit to his truth. They want their own truth. Well, that's cool. So I'm going to go with this one because this is the only thing that has outlasted everything else. Amen. It's what we have to lean our entire lives on. It means they just didn't want to obey. They didn't like what God was calling, the, what, what God's calling his kids to. But see, God is the one that opens our eyes to truth. We don't, we don't even get to do that as much as we'd like to for people that we love. Uh, we look at 1 Corinthians 2, the natural person, the person that has not submitted to God, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him. They're folly. They're foolishness. They're, 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 they're not truth. And he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. He can't see it, right? And so they don't want to obey. They don't want to submit. And it's because this is what they were destined by God to do. See, the word of God gives life to those who receive it. The word of God gives everything we need, but you reject it and you cut off that life source. And it says, it says why. It says that they were destined to do. This is the idea of the sovereign God being in charge. God is the one in charge. God is the one who elects. God is the one who directs. It's all up to God how this plays out. It's us simply receiving him, right? This is what we do. So he's destined it. We simply step into it. And, and some would argue, well, what about free will? What about my free will? Well, glad you asked. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about free will and what it actually means. Kids, I'll make a simple definition. Free will is our choice to sin or not. That's our free will. You didn't get to decide when you were born. Ultimately, you don't get to decide when you die. Even if you think suicide would be you picking that day, I would say it's already predetermined. You don't get to pick. He picks. He picks. Jesus says in John, no one would choose me. I chose you. It's a good thing. It's not an offensive doctrine. This is good. This is God extending his mercy and his love. This is a good thing. This is something that we get to say thank you for and then live our lives as such, living set apart lives. This is good. Truthfully, though, for a person to, to be set apart, to, to be free from sin, it requires us to be reborn. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. We have to literally submit ourselves fully to God run away from what's holding us back. And then, and then once we're reborn in Christ, we're, we're being made righteous because of Jesus Christ. That's how this works. It's the only way that this works. It, we have freedom to no longer pursue sin. There's your free will. You choose no. Again, are you going to do it perfect? Nah, I woke up today, which means I'm not going to, but Jesus covers that. It just means I'm not intentionally pursuing sin. I'm not chasing after it. It means that we submit ourselves to the truths of Christ, even the ones that are hard, even the ones that we don't fully understand, even the ones that culture says is crazy. We submit ourselves to every word of God. And then we obey it. That looks like a spiritual sacrifice to me. And that's what it looks like to him. And he truly deserves our worship for what he has done. So now Peter, he's not quite done. He's going to bring forth a couple of commands. In nine, but you are a chosen race. He says you're a royal priesthood. There's that word again. A holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See that three-letter word at the beginning? But. He's transitioning from talking about those who reject Christ now to onto those who have received him. He's transitioning us to, 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 from an unbeliever to a believer. And he, he's addressing the elect exiles 2,000 years ago. He's addressing us today. And again, he talks about election. He says, you are a chosen race. He says, believers, all believers, believers from thousands of years ago to now to whenever Jesus comes back, all believers, you're a chosen race. We're a chosen race. Stop for a moment. We can talk about race without being weird. A race, a people group, set apart people group. My dad and I got to go to Portugal a few years ago. Guess what Portuguese men look like? This guy. They got curly, dark hair, some of them. They've got dark eyes. They got a little olive complexion. They're about my height. A race. It's not bad. You know Portuguese people when you see them. 
Christ followers, you are a chosen race. That means you look different from the world, but we look alike. This ain't about skin tone, ain't about hair. This is about how we live our lives, set apart as a chosen, set apart by God to be a race, to be his own people group. That's us. It's not physical anymore. It's so far past a physical thing. God didn't choose Israel to be his chosen people because they offered more than all the other nations. Deuteronomy 7. Moses says, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest. They were the underdogs, right? Of all the peoples. But it is because the Lord loved you. This is why God chose them. He's like, I love these people. Those are my people. Now, in Christ, he says, I love you people. You're my people. We've been what's called grafted into Israel. We've been grafted in. If you've ever, I've never successfully grafted a tree, but how they do it is they take a branch, they put in some really cool like vitamins and things, and then I, I'm blowing it. I know, Doug, my flower guy, but it's like when things are grafted in, you, it, it forms. They, they become one together. They're together, okay? So we've been, because of Jesus Christ, we're now grafted in to God's chosen people, a chosen race set apart. With Christ, we're in. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for doing exactly that and allowing us to be a part of your chosen race. I love this idea that God has for us. It goes a little farther, and he, and he says, uh, a royal priesthood. Okay, so we've talked about, you know, the holy priesthood. We talked about being set apart, being priests in God's house. Now we live our lives as priests. Now he brings in this idea of royalty. Why would he do that? Because Jesus Christ is what? The king of of kings. And we're now a part of royalty. So there you've been christened. You come to Jesus and you're part of what's called a royal priesthood, a literal royal priesthood, because Jesus Christ is our King of kings and the Lord of lords. And this is also now what we get to be a part of. And, and he goes one step further. He calls us a, a holy nation. This is what Jesus Christ's people are a part of. A nation, right, obviously is set apart with borders, set apart with rules. A nation would be set apart by how they govern all of these things, right? Does that sound like the church is supposed to operate as a holy priesthood, right? And we got this holy nation idea, chosen race. So this means that we, we, uh, we're Americans, right, for most of us that live here, uh, but our citizenship is in heaven. So this idea of being a holy nation, Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, right? And for uh, we wait a savior, Jesus Christ. So we're, we're literally submitting our knee to the king. So I'm going to tell you right now that the laws of Jesus Christ in heaven are a lot higher than the United States. I was a realtor for years. And uh, the National, Associ of National Association of Realtors has a code of ethics, a standard that you had to have to meet. All realtors have to abide by this line, okay? And then I hung my license with an, uh, an organization in Bellingham that was significantly higher than theirs. I have a point. They said, sure, this is what every realtor has to ascribe by, but if you want to hang your license here, you have to reach these. This is our code of ethics, which was significantly higher than the bar that was set back in 2000 when I was doing it. The point remains for us here as Christ followers, here's, here's morality from the world's level. And Jesus says, no, this is my people. This is how they will know you. They will know you are my disciples by your love. This is how we are set apart, by how we love, how we live. We obey heaven's laws, not the earth's laws. That's too low. Christ followers, that's way too low. Jesus says, you're my people here. This is where I need you, Christianity 101. He's commanding us to live our lives set apart. And he says, you're a people for my own possession. I love this idea. In our unsaved condition, we're not God's people. We're rejecting him. We hate him. We live our lives in opposition to what he has called us to. But then we get Jesus, right? We surrender our life to Christ. We repent of our sin. We're chasing after him. And now we're a people of his own possession. God says, these are my kids. These are my kids. You're mine. I want you to be my child is what he says to his kids today. I like the idea that I'm possessed by God. But in the alternative, God's possession. We belong to God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we get this. So why? Why? 
Why all of this preaching? Why? What's the point? Right here. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into this marvelous light. This is why. We are here to praise him. We are here to glorify him. Why do we not sin? Because we're going to get in trouble? Because your wife's going to get mad at you? Because you might lose your job? No. We don't sin because we don't want to sin against the holy God first and most. That's the heart of a Christ follower. We live our lives proclaiming his excellencies, bragging about who Jesus is. This is who we are. This is what we're supposed to do. Kids, we are a set-apart people to praise God. That's what we're here for. Everywhere we go. This term, this terminology actually literally means we're kind of a living billboard. So picture yourself as a living billboard walking around. Your billboard is praising Jesus. That's what it's supposed to be doing. You're supposed to not be sinning at, because you're proclaiming how good he is. That's what's on display. That's what's supposed to be on display. So this living billboard, what are you advertising? How you live your life. I just, I'm just curious. You don't say it out loud. That might be a little bit weird. But what are you advertising? You're advertising how you live your life. You're advertising what you believe in. You advertise what is real and what's true to you. A living billboard is made to proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus, of him who has called you out of darkness into, mercy, into marvelous excuse me, light. We talk often here that there's really two teams. That's it. There's team Jesus, for those that bow in, and there's team Satan, those that are rejecting him, those that are in opposition. If that offends you, then switch teams. With this idea of having two teams, it means that we literally have been set apart to praise God. That's why we're here. That is why we're here. Not just to sing a couple songs, not just to go to church on a Sunday. Our entire lives are a living billboard of us praising God for his goodness, his forgiveness, his mercy, his shed blood, his love, his redemption, his future coming back. This is us praising him all day long. We've been called out of spiritual darkness. That means that at one point we were blinded by our sin. It means we couldn't see. So God has called us out of that. He's opened our eyes to his goodness, his love, and his mercy. That's what we've been called out of. No longer pursuing things that are anti-Christ. Wouldn't that make sense that a Christ follower wouldn't pursue things that are anti-Christ? Living billboard, again, set apart. Called out of darkness into marvelous light. There he goes using that word called again. Jesus is the one that takes us and pulls us out. This is what he does. This idea of marvelous light. That's what we're called to be in a dark world, aren't we? Be a light among them. Show them how good Jesus is by how you live your life. Praising God along the way. This is just us simply being Christ followers, walking in obedience. And, and if that's not clear enough, he, he finishes with this. He says, once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but, but now you have received mercy. Set apart yet again. Peter's using imagery from Hosea. Have you read Hosea lately? Fascinating book. Fascinating book of the Old Testament. Hosea 1.6. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name no mercy, for I will have no more mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. They had rejected and rebelled against God so much. He prophesied through the birth of a child, the name of that child, what he was going to do. Hosea 1.9, and the Lord said, call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. He was sick of their rebellion. He was sick of their rejection. He's sick of it today, and that's why he's made a way. His name is Jesus Christ. Because with Jesus Christ, there is a way. With Jesus Christ, we are a people. With Jesus Christ, there is mercy and forgiveness. Without, not. Obviously, this is a reference to Hosea, but it's for us today that God has redeemed them and God has redeemed us. So put simply, kids, because of Jesus, we are now a part of the people of God. A chosen race set apart Receiving the mercy because of Christ. Let me show you one more illustration. My little buddy. 
This is David, one of our goats in our fence. He's my little homie. He's actually goofing around. I was taking pictures of him yesterday, and he felt like sticking his tongue out at me. <laughs> so we put up a fence so that he wouldn't get eaten or hit by a car. We put up a fence because we know what's best for him. We put up a fence to say, you're part of our chosen group. This is what we have done. We extended our love, our, I, I would even go as far as to say mercy, because this guy wouldn't last two minutes out in the wild. So we have, we have all of this here encapsulated on the cornerstone idea again, tying all this together. But see, like, like David in the Old Testament, not to pun on the name, he walked in disobedience, didn't he? He left God's fence. He went against God's mercy. He went against what God wanted. He, he disobeyed directly. And the consequences affected for household after household, for generation after generation. So like my buddy David behind us, stay in the fence. Like my buddy David behind us, Rely on what it is that God has put in front of you to surround you. This is a good thing. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. This is only and all because of Jesus. All of this is only and all because of Jesus. You know what all this means? That there's an opportunity to repent. For those of you that haven't. You might be like, well, that's a lot of, a lot of Bible stuff. I'm going to tell you right now, you either reject him or you receive him. Those are your two options. For some of you, you may have some more questions. That's great. But if you sense the love of God, the calling of God, two choices, reject or receive. Because guess what? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the good news of Jesus Christ right there. Everyone. He, he's not prejudiced. I've seen God do miracles and save people that, that honestly seem like the entire deck was stacked, stacked against them. And then God says, no, here's my mercy, here's my love, here's my forgiveness, come and receive. So we have two choices. We can reject that, right? Or we can actually receive that and live a life that is set apart, repenting of our sins, running after him, and no longer running after what he doesn't want. This is about us trusting God. He's proven himself. He's proven himself to you and you know it. He's not actually let you down like you may think. He's orchestrating all events for his glory and for your good. So I want each of us here that, that loves Christ to continue living this life of obedience through spiritual sacrifices, giving up what the world is saying is good, and you know what's good, and it's not that. So I want us to start doing this, but for those of you that aren't there, I want you there. Paul's heart is that, you can even read in Romans 10, he's just like, I just, I just wish you were saved. I wish you had your eyes open. I want you to repent and, re and, and stop rejecting God. God truly separated his people. For his special purposes. I love this about God. So I'm going to end with the Westminster Catechism. I believe that they put it best. What is the chief end of man? It's a question. Very simple answer. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why we're here. That's why we were born. That's why we were chosen. That's why we are set apart. That's why we chase after him and not after sin. Our purpose, our entire life's purpose is wrapped up in one sentence to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's why you're set apart. Now go do it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, again, I, I, I give you thanks. Somehow you supernaturally preserved your very own word for a couple thousand years. Even more than that, because we have so many Old Testament references here, God. Preserve your very word so we can learn from it today. God, I, 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 you're calling us out of our sin. You're calling us out of our lukewarmness. You're calling us out of our doubt. You're calling us out of, out of living like the world. God, thank you for calling us to a higher level. Thank you for calling us to, to walk in obedience, pursuing you, offering our lives as a spiritual sacrifice. I thank you that we get to be a part of what it is that you're doing and that you're walking with us even now. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters as they go from here later today, as your missionaries sent out to the very world, the very spheres of influence that you've called them to, God, I pray that their impact would be profound 
And they would be able to share your good news, your love, what it is that you have done. They would have ample opportunities to share with people how amazing you are for them. And God, I thank you. I thank you for everything you've done and everything you're doing. And I'm desperate for you, Jesus, and we all are. In your name we pray. Amen.